Professor Peter Singer is the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and Laureate Professor at the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne. He specializes in applied ethics and approaches ethical issues from a secular utilitarian perspective. Professor Peter Singer, thank you for taking time to talk. You're very welcome. I've been teaching your ideas for a long time, so it's really, uh, it's really an honor. So our topic today is organ donation, and the first thing I'd like to ask you is, what do you think is the best moral philosophy argument for living, living organ donation, and could it be a moral obligation or merely a kind gesture of altruism? Well, the best argument for it is that there are people who, because of uh, kidney disease, are living on dialysis. Uh, their quality of life on dialysis is, is pretty poor often, uh, and their life expectancy is significantly reduced. Uh, on the other hand, healthy people with two kidneys can do very well with one kidney. We don't really need two kidneys. The chances that you will suffer greatly or even have a shorter life because of donating a kidney are uh, really small. Uh, one estimate I've seen is, is one in 4,000. It may even be less than that if you are not suffering from various other medical conditions. Um, so, and therefore is uh, you can do a lot more good or your kidney can do a lot more good in someone else's body than uh, uh, one of them anyway is doing in your own. Um, now, does that mean that it's a moral obligation? Um, that's that's tough in, in one sense from the utilitarian point of view that, as you just said, is I think the, the correct ethical point of view. Uh, yes, um, you know, we really ought to do what will have the best consequences and donating a kidney will have the best consequences. But, but to use a, a heavy term like saying it's your moral obligation um, may be counterproductive in a way. It may make people feel terribly guilty if they don't do it. Um, and, and because it's, there are very, very few people doing it at the moment, there are, there are some and I'm, it's growing, but it's still a tiny proportion of the population as a whole who would be eligible to do this. I think um, it, the, the language may be a bit too heavy for them, you know, because yes, that's somehow you're doing something really badly wrong if you don't, whereas in fact, well, you're not doing the right thing perhaps, but, but you're doing what most people are doing, that is not donating a kidney to people who need it. So um, I'd, I'd rather say, I'd rather praise people who do donate than condemn or you know, blame people who don't donate. Got it. Do you, do you believe one second kidney could be viewed as a luxury? And how does your argument about the moral problem with buying coffee, as opposed to donating for a malaria net, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis being a luxury versus saving a life, apply here? Is an organ fundamentally different from one's money, or is it another form of luxury that can, is comparable? Well, there's, not, there's something slightly funny about saying that something that you're born with and that everybody else has is a luxury. Um, I suppose, you know, you, uh, you could say, well, you know, why did we evolve to have two kidneys? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe there's some about uh, symmetry, if you like, you know, the various things that we have two of, um, uh, and that that somehow is a pattern by which we and, and many other animals, of course, evolved. Um, and, and you couldn't have called it a luxury until we had the ability to remove one and uh, save someone's life or greatly benefit somebody from it. And that's only very recently. But I suppose you, what you could say is that the development of this technology, uh, medical technology for transplanting a kidney, um, has made it something that it's optional and that we don't really need. Um, and yes, in, in that strict sense of the term, it, it's a luxury. Um, now, you asked how does it compare with, uh, you know, the luxuries of, going out and, and buying a coffee or buying bottled water when the water that comes out of your tap is safe to drink, uh, those things are luxuries too. Uh, the answer to that is it's a lot easier to uh, you know, not buy the bottled water, or, you know, unless you're a real coffee addict, to pass up the coffee or to make the coffee at home where you save a couple of dollars by doing that. Um, that's a lot easier for most people than the thought of going in a hospital, having a kidney removed, I mean, a few days off work, um, and, you know, people do worry about the idea that something may go wrong. Um, and although, as I said, the chances are very small, it's possible. So, so that's the difference, that one of them is really very easy to do and there's, in a way, 
no excuse for not doing it. The other one, I can be more, you know, empathize with people who feel that this is a, a much bigger deal. Great. So moving from personal choice to societal incentives, do you believe we should open up the market for selling organs? And um, the concern, of course, has been exploitation of the poor. On the other hand, if a model could be put in place where no one could be on dialysis, no one could die of kidney failure, would it be worth it? Yes. Um, so I don't think we should just have a, a, an unregulated market, uh, as you suggested. We need a different model than that, um, because not only could it lead to exploitation of the poor, uh, but it could also mean that only the rich can get these organs. Um, and I don't really think that how rich you are ought to be critical to whether you live or die. Um, you know, unfortunately, it often is, but I'd like to reduce that to the greatest extent I can. So um, what I can imagine is a, a regulated system uh, that provides incentives for people to uh, donate an organ. I would use the word donate rather than sell um, uh, because I would be thinking of incentives that would be provide lasting benefits for them. So rather than a cash payment, which you know you can imagine people might spend on you know the annex they might spend on getting drugs or or they might, you know, gamble or, or whatever it might be, and then they're worse off, you know, and they don't have anything more to do. Um, I'm thinking of things like uh, providing them with uh, some long term income, uh, you know, some sort of fund that pays them a a dividend uh, on a regular basis or uh, education for their children if they have children. Uh, clearly, uh, health insurance, uh, long-term health insurance that they don't have to pay for would be a, a valuable thing. So I think we could provide some long-term incentives that would mean they would not be being exploited. And the kidneys would not go, so it would not be a private transaction where some wealthy person says, hey, I'll pay you $100,000 for your kidney. Um, but rather the kidneys would go to be allocated by hospitals to the next person on the waiting list, um, independently of that person's means. Amazing. Do, do you think our policies around end of life decisions uh, should be different, um, given the amount of expenses that go towards maintaining people on end of life care, and given the number of lives we could save through end of life organ donation? Uh, Yes. Uh, well, certainly I think our policy should be different, um, depending on what part of the United States you're in right now, because, of course, uh, a number of states, in, including uh, all of the West Coast, uh, Washington, Oregon and California, as well as uh, I think Vermont and a couple of others, uh, do now allow people to uh, have the assistance of a physician in ending their life. Uh, and that uh, clearly you know, gives people something that they want. Um, uh, as well as reducing medical expenses, incidentally. I mean, I don't think that should be the primary reason, but it's it's really crazy to keep people alive at great expense in hospital when they have themselves rationally decided that they don't want to go on living, that their quality of life is too poor, um, that they have no prospect of recovery from the condition that they're dying from. Um, so I, I favor uh, that kind of choice to have uh, physician assistance in dying. And then when that is happens, of course, people could elect to donate their organs. And uh, certainly at that point, it's a much easier thing to do. You have no further use for them. You don't have to worry about something going wrong. So, yeah, I think really everybody um, at the end of life should think about what organs they're capable of donating. Great. La uh, last two questions. Um, how might or might not, well, uh, taking a step back, um, one of the main reasons uh, that some share with me why they don't want to donate is less the family member come to come to need their organ. Um, how might or might not util, utilitarian thought show familial preference that one might save their kidney for a potential family member rather than give immediately to a stranger? Well, I mean, I, I understand that, and I think utilitarian thinking just has to accept that you know we are mammals, which means that uh, we care about our close relatives. That's that's. Uh, obviously necessary for us and our genes to survive, that we look after our children. And, and we don't just look after them, but we love them and, and think about them. And, uh, you know, there's a very close link between our happiness and our happiness of our children or other close family members. So we, we have to accept this. It's not something we're going to change or indeed not something that we really should change. Um, 
So I think what we need to do is to think of a model for overcoming that, and one would be to say that anybody who does donate a kidney um, gets priority for kidneys that will become available should they ever need it, not only for themselves, but also for their immediate family members. So they, you know, you would have to define that, obviously, their children, maybe their siblings, something like that. Um, possibly their parents can happen. So, so you, would, you would give them a kind of a guarantee that uh, if this were to happen, which is pretty unlikely, but it will happen occasionally, um, they and they, the, the people that they love would be looked after in that situation. Great. My last question is a quick one. Have people told you that your arguments have uh, ever led them to kidney donation for themselves? Uh, yes, I, I have heard that from uh, a couple of people, actually. Um, uh, a guy called Chris Croy wrote to me and said that he, my argument was discussed in his class uh, at the college that he was at in Missouri. And um, after thinking about that for a while, uh, he was led to approach a hospital and donate a kidney. He did so. Uh, happy that he's done that. So um, I've, I've heard from, from a couple who were influenced, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, I, I find it uh, impressive that the power of philosophical argument is so great that somebody will do that. Absolutely. Wonderful. Professor Singer, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it so much. Good. You're very welcome. Good to talk to you. Wishing Bye. you a lot of success in all your continued work. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All the best. Okay.